Good morning, my valued teachers. You guys can stand. We'll start to sing and the songs of worship with, but first we'll start with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us here once again on a Sunday morning. We thank you for the freedom to be able to worship you. We thank you for the freedom to be able to gather in your name, Lord. We just we ask that during today's service, Lord, you speak mightily to us, Lord. You you change your hearts, you change your minds, Lord. Let this time of worship be a be a time where we can lay all things down at your feet and just worship the God of creation, Lord, and enjoy your presence. Father, we love you and we we give this time to you in your name. Amen.
Really, really good. Malia's excited about that. And if Malia's excited about it, the rest of us should be too, right? So that's going to be fun. Other cool stuff that I'll be announcing over the next couple weeks for some of our later Food Truck Fridays in terms of some live music and stuff like that that we're working on. We're very, very excited for it, uh, but the details aren't quite worked out. But be ready. Uh, Merge Evangelism class. This is associated with our summer missions trips that we're going on. There's still room on these trips. If you would like to come, please speak with me. We're going to show a video next week about the intergenerational mission venture going to Colorado City, Arizona, and Hilldale, Utah. Such an awesome time. Amazing trip. This merge class is training for that, but it's also really it's training for evangelism. And so the question would be, what, what percentage of Christians are called to evangelize? 100%. So even if you're not going on a missions trip, you can still learn some valuable things for this Merge Evangelism class Wednesdays, 6 p.m. all throughout the month of June. I would love for you to be there. You're thinking, is he talking to me? The answer is yes. Yes, I'm talking to you. Uh, one last thing before we do some greeting time and Pastor Josh comes up and shares a great message with us. Uh, just wanted to announce a couple... A couple weeks ago, we had a pastor candidate here, Keith Young, if you guys remember that. It seems like a while ago, but it was really just a couple Sundays ago. He preached both services. We did a bunch of different meetings throughout the weekend. They came over to our picnic and got to know some people and stuff like that. We'll just want to announce he is going to be our senior pastor. Very Awesome news. Great family. Great preacher. Great guy, we're very excited. Um, we're working on getting them out here in July, hopefully early in July, that would be great. Um, so you could just pray for that process with them as they're wrapping up things in Wisconsin where they're at. Their church is going through kind of like a merger um, with some other churches in the area and different things like that. So they're, they're knowing that this is happening and they're aware that he'll be gone in the next few weeks and everything, but uh, still they have they have a home that they just put up for sale over there. And so just pray for pray for all that fun stuff that happens when you move from Wisconsin to California. So a lot of stuff going on for them, but lift them up and praise the Lord that they're coming. Absolutely, we're very excited for that. Uh, so what you guys could do right now is just get up and meet and greet. I do have the middle school and the high school with me in the youth room for class this morning. All the other classes, all the young people can just head down that direction. Say hi to somebody around you. It's going to be up here in just a few minutes. Once again, as I already been said, my name is Josh, and I'm from Paleo Church in El Cajon. And I just want to say, to, before we even start, just thank you. Uh, thank Pine Valley Community Church for supporting us in our Circuit City basketball camp. It really is a blast every year. We have over 300 kids throughout the week of the camp. Any given day, we have about 250 kids, and so it's kind of organized mass chaos. But all of these kids get to hear the gospel every day. And they all enjoy it. They all have a blast, and the volunteers definitely have a blast too. So if you know if you're free that week, or uh, if you have kids that age from five to sixteen that want to join the camp, feel free to come out and, and join us. It, it's, it's a good time, and it's also just a joy to see churches working together. So Pine Valley is one of the churches that's coming to support us, but we also have a church from LA coming down to support us. We have a church from Washington coming down to support us. We have some people from a church in Minnesota coming to support us. So. There's a lot of different churches and organizations that are supporting this camp. It's not just Paleo Church, so we, again, just thank you for, for your support in that. All right, our scripture text for tonight is going to come from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So I'll read that for us. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord... Your labor is not in vain. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your love that you've given us in your son Jesus to redeem us from all of our sin and to give us hope and joy and resurrection life, knowing that all of our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so I pray that you would just use this passage this morning to comfort our hearts 
in, in times of loss and discouragement. May your word be a comfort to us. May your Holy Spirit also encourage us and empower us to, uh, to labor, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that it is not in vain. The Lord, the things that we do are eternal because they are through Christ and in Christ. And so may that empower us, encourage us to continue on in the good fight um, of the faith. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I would venture to guess that everyone in this room, everyone here this morning, has had something in your life that has not gone according to your plan. It has not turned out how you thought or hoped that it would. Things that you put a lot of time and effort into, maybe you put your heart and soul into, even people in your lives that you put your heart and soul into loving them, serving them, and things or that relationship did not turn out the way that you had hoped. Well, you are not alone. When I graduated from Westminster Seminary in Escondido in 2011, my wife and I thought and prayed a lot about where God was going to call us in the next season of our life to use our time, talent, and treasure in order to love people for the kingdom of God. At that time, I had considered seriously the <clears throat> possibility of going on and getting a PhD in early church history. I was passionate about church history, loved church history, and thought maybe God's calling me to go on and become a professor to teach that. But I, we'd also been faithful members of the church in the college area during this time, throughout my time in seminary in San Diego. And we loved our church. We loved our church. And when I say church, I mean primarily like the people of our church. And I think you guys can probably relate to that. Church is primarily the people, not just an organization or an institution. We love the people, the family that God had given us here in San Diego. So after a lot of time and prayer and confirmation with other people in the church, we had decided to stay and to continue to serve this church in the college area in San Diego. And there wasn't even a pastoral opening at the time. So I'm graduating from seminary, not even a pastoral opening at the time. Didn't know how I was going to make a living. But I, we, after all that prayer and confirmation, we had, were fully convinced this is where God wants us to serve his kingdom, at this church in the college area. And for many years, that was amazing. We grew a lot. We saw a lot of fruit in the ministry. I became, I became one of the lay elders at the church. We started a coffee shop in our community. During that time, um, with the goal of really just being missional to our community, using that as a hub for just community and inviting people to church and being on mission. <clears throat> so through these few years, our coffee shop and the, and the church, they were both thriving, they were both doing well in a lot of fruitful ways. We even had the privilege of sending off a, off a group of people from our church to plant a new church in Washington. So we're planting churches, a lot of fruit happening. Now, of course, as you can imagine, like these sorts of things, there's always setbacks and challenges. So we, we experience a lot of challenges along the way. But when you experience challenges and difficulties, if you see also a lot of fruit and a lot of good things happening, then you know, like, it's all worth it. This is, all these hardships are worth it because we see the fruit. We see God transforming people's lives through both the church and the coffee shop. But then, within a matter of just a couple of years, everything started to unravel. Our primary preaching pastor of our church left suddenly and unexpectedly at a very vulnerable time after we had just planted that church. It was just a few months after we had just sent off a lot of our core members to plant that new church. And so eventually, through a long series of events and decisions, we closed the church and merged with Kaleo Church. So praise God for Kaleo Church. And Tim, the pastor who preached here last week, also supported us and loved us a lot through that time. And now that I wasn't connected with a church in the college area anymore, where, where our coffee shop was located, a lot of the mo main motivations we had for running the coffee shop, kind of being like an avenue to bring people and draw people into the church, a lot of that was gone. And so we decided to sell our coffee shop in the spring of 2020. So before that happened, COVID hit. <laughs> and basically killed our coffee shop. Our coffee shop was down 93% in revenue from 2019 to 2020. Um, now, by God's grace, we were able to hold on to the coffee shop for a couple more years and build it back up to a point where we could finally sell it off, but for much less than what, what we had planned to, to sell it off for in 2020. So as you can imagine, that, that period of two to three years was like a sucker punch to 
to the guts for me and my family. By all earthly measures, it was hard not to feel like a failure. Our church had failed. And even after pouring hours and into, into loving people, to praying for people in our church, inevitably when transitions like that happen, like people leave hurt, discouraged, confused, Our business had failed, even if not totally, like I said. It certainly did not reach the pinnacle of our hopes and dreams when we had started it eight years earlier. And those last two years of COVID, especially um, after, after COVID had hit, were pretty brutal at running that coffee shop. I, the part of the job that I loved the most was just pouring into our employees, the, the various employees. We had like nine employees when COVID hit, and we had to basically let go of all of our employees. And so now I'm just working in the coffee shop all by myself every day. Like, this isn't very exciting. This was kind of a drudgery to go to work every day rather than a joy. Didn't have near as many customers, didn't have our employees anymore. And so a lot of that joy was gone as well. And so during this period, it was easy to want to question God. Like, God, what? What are you doing? What are you doing? I thought you had called us to serve your kingdom here at this church, through this coffee shop, in the college area. So what's going on? Both of these things are gone now. Again, failure, failures by any worldly measure. <clears throat> so there was a lot to wrestle with God about. Hurt, disappointments, unmet expectations, lost dreams, second guessing myself. Thinking, did I, did I make the wrong decision back in 2011 when I decided not to go on and get my PhD and stay in San Diego instead? Was all this, was all this time wasted? Now, you can probably all relate in some way or another. And if you can't, you will, will someday. Just live long enough <laughs> and you will someday. <laughs> and even if you can't relate on like the big scale of like life decisions, you can certainly relate on just everyday experience, right? We all live and experience like vanity of life under the sun, as the Ecclesiastes preacher says. Our labor is not always fruitful and lasting. The dishes and laundry, once complete, the house beautifully cleaned up, just has to be done again the next day. The car, that house repair that you've been working hard on to fix, sometimes just leads you into further financial stress and time. The extra effort you've been putting in at work goes unnoticed. The kids that you love and serve and discipline seem to struggle with the same sin over and over again. And so this, our shared human experience reminds us that all too often, loss is a part of life in a fallen world. So the question is, was the preacher of Ecclesiastes right when he said in Ecclesiastes 1, 13, and 14, it is an unhappy business that, the, that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. All is vanity and and striving after women. Was he right? Well, in a sense, yes, he was right. <laughs> Life under the sun can often feel arbitrary and cruel and meaningless, vanity, right? It can feel that way. But that isn't the whole story for those of us who trust in Jesus, is it? Yeah. Because 1 Corinthians 15 is about much more than just life under the sun. It is about redeemed life, restored life, resurrection life. And so during that difficult season in my life, no verse would be a greater comfort to my soul than this verse from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Through it, God reminded me that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Even when your labor does not produce the results that you desire, right? We all have, when we set out doing labor, we all have results, goals in mind that we want to see happen, accomplished. Even things that we think God wants accomplished, right? And through this, when those, when those end goals aren't accomplished, we can be reminded that our labor is still not in vain. If your labor is done from a place of faith, a place of dependence on Christ, and for the purpose of glorifying Christ, for the purpose of loving Christ and loving people, 
And with thanksgiving in your heart, knowing that your labor is ultimately not even derived from you, it's a labor of the Lord in you and through you, then your labor is never wasted. He reminded me through this verse that to let God be God. Let God be in charge of the results. Right? We don't need to be in control of the results. We don't need to produce the results. Our job is simply to be faithful, abounding in the work of the Lord. That's God's measure of success for us is faithfulness, not results. So let's hear from God today through this verse. And I think he wants to, one, comfort us through this verse. Because, again, we've all experienced failure, right? We've all experienced loss. We've all experienced things that didn't turn out the way we wanted them to. And so through this verse, God wants to comfort us. But he also wants to empower us to get back up and do it again. Get back up. Our labor is not wasted. Our labor is not in vain. And so we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit through the gospel to continue abounding in the work of the Lord. So, as we first start off, I just want to start off with the command in this verse, because the primary purpose of this verse is to give us a command as, as God's people. In verse uh, 58, the command comes in three parts. It says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So the first one, be steadfast. Be steadfast. It means to be deeply rooted. Not wavering from one thing to another because you're firmly established like a tree planted by streams of water. Colossians 1.23, Paul kind of clarifies what he means by being steadfast. In that verse he says, continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. And so in times of trial or disappointment, when all of your labor seems to be in vain, Satan is going to want to do everything to get you to shift your hope off of the gospel and onto the things of this world. Maybe if I just try harder. Maybe if I go and try something else, something different. Then I'll succeed. That's where my hope lies, is in success and the things of this world. Maybe we run to the things of this world for comfort or affirmation. And maybe when we don't get those things, we give ourselves over to anger or bitterness. And Paul comes in this verse and he says, no, be steadfast. Be steadfast. Why? Because the gospel is our only true hope. The gospel is our only true hope. If we circle back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, we've been preaching throughout the book of Corinthians at Kaleo. Um, so a little bit of context. But this is the, the great chapter where, where Paul lays out the gospel and the resurrection life that we have through the gospel, right? So if you go all the way back to verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 15, he begins this chapter by saying, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. In which you stand. So when the storms of life come, we stand, we take our stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ, because his promises to us in the gospel will always stand. Even when all else gives way, like St. Jesus saying, Jesus is our rock. Be steadfast. Second command, be immovable. Okay, so what does immovable mean? Immovable does not mean to simply be inactive, right? In fact, it's a call to action because in this life there will always be forces working against us, whether that be our own sinful desires or like lies from the enemy from, from the outside, that want to move us off of the gospel from which we stand. So if you're my age, you can remember like back in the 90s, American Gladiators, and they had that one contest where they're like on the two pillars and they're trying to knock each other off of the pillar. That's kind of what I imagine. Like, no, be immovable. Don't, don't let the forces of evil, don't let the lies of the enemy, don't even let your own sin knock you off that, that gospel on which you stand. So we actively fight. We actively fight against our own sin and against the lies of the enemy with the gospel as our defense. Again, going back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. There's that word again, vain, right? Vain, vanity. If we don't want our labor to be in vain, if we don't want our lives to be in vain, 
meaningless, then don't be moved. We hold fast to what? We hold fast to the gospel. Hold fast to the gospel. Hold fast to Jesus. Jesus is our sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Right? He's, he's the immovable one. And so we hold fast to him. Jesus Christ isn't going anywhere. So if we cling to him by faith, if we are in Christ, you hear that phrase a lot throughout the New Testament, in Christ, if we are in Christ, then we are immovable whatever life throws at us. Now, it's not always going to feel that way, is it? Life doesn't feel immovable. Life feels like a roller coaster. Like, what is going on here? we got twists and turns throughout. But our hope is anchored in Jesus throughout all of life's twists and turns. It's anchored in heaven. It's anchored at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where Jesus is. And so by faith, we hold fast to him, no matter how life feels in the moment. We are anchored. All right, the final command of this verse is always abounding in the work of the Lord. All right, what does this mean? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Does this mean I have to drop everything and go become a missionary in a far-off land to take the gospel to the nations? Well, maybe for some. Maybe for some, right? That certainly has been the calling that the Lord has placed upon many missionaries throughout history, and even now, taking the gospel to the nations. So I don't want to think that this isn't a radical call, always abounding in the work of the call, in the, in the work of the Lord, is a radical call. But this command is not just for missionaries or pastors. This command is for every Christian, every person who puts their faith in Jesus, to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. This is, encompasses all of life, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So, in essence, it's saying that everything we do should be done from faith in Jesus for the glory of God with thanksgiving in our hearts. That's what it means to abound in the work of the Lord. Paul states it negatively in, in Romans 14, 23, when he says, For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So that means that to abound in the work of the Lord, we must first be trusting and depending on Jesus, right? His promises to us in the gospel and his presence with us by the Holy Spirit. Without that, then whatever we're doing, no matter how good it looks externally, is sin. That's what Paul says in Romans 14.23. This also means that we live our lives, as we live our lives, we enjoy and treasure Jesus above all earthly treasures. Right? Our faith and our dependence is in him, not in the things of this world. We don't look to the things of this world for our comfort and our hope. We look to Christ. He's our treasure. He's our joy. And that's often, we don't like to hear this, but that's often demonstrated to the world most clearly when we're undergoing suffering or persecution or hardship or things aren't going our way. And we're still clinging to Jesus through all of that. Like, there's something different about that person. He's not just using Jesus to get what he wants. He actually loves Jesus more than what he wants in the, in the things of this world. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So here we see that this command from the Lord is all-encompassing. It encompasses not just the big things in life, but also the little things in life. Eating and drinking. We don't think about that that much. Just eating and drinking to the glory of the Lord, right? Eating and drinking. Teaching our kids, working at our jobs, serving around the house, volunteering in our community. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so here we see the purpose of God abounding in the work of the Lord. It's to give glory to God. Right? We want to make him look good to the world. Make him look like the most valuable one because he is. And that purpose, to give God glory... To God is encompasses all of life, no matter how, how big or how small. No matter how seemingly insignificant and small the task that God has given you might, might seem. You see, I think sometimes when we're stuck in like the mundane of everyday life, we can start to believe that what we do doesn't matter. Right? We can start to wonder if walking in God's ways really makes any difference in the world. What's the, what's the purpose of this? We might start to think that only God only works through the big and successful. Or that God only works through the strong and the powerful. We may believe the lie that at first glance what seems insignificant doesn't matter, doesn't make a difference in the world. 
We may even start to doubt our place or our identity in our church, in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, our neighborhoods. Yet I think this command comes to remind us that it all matters. Everything matters. Everything that we do, all of our labor matters. It all has eternal significance that done for faith in Jesus for the glory of God. And if, you, if you're doubting that, if you're questioning, oh, does it really matter? I don't know. If you think that it doesn't, just look at Jesus' own life. Think of this. The Son of God, creator of heaven and earth, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, the Son of God came down and lived on this earth, and for 30 years, before he started his public ministry, what was he doing? He was just living a normal human life, right? Glorifying God the Father, living by faith in God the Father, doing what? He was just doing the mundane tasks of life. He was a brother. He was a son. He was a worker, laboring a job as a carpenter. So whether you're a child obeying your parents, a brother looking out for his siblings, a carpenter repairing a house, a preacher sharing the good news, Jesus did all of those things. And so if Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of heaven and earth, came down and said, this, this matters, it matters so much that I'm willing to do these things, then certainly we can believe that all of those things matter to him in our lives as well. Part of our, we have a family mission statement, and part of our family's mission statements that I pray over our kids every day on the way to school says this, Moffitt's love, serve, and protect, and in Christ push back darkness every day for the good of others, the glory of God, and the joy of all peoples. Wow. So we push back darkness. I just like that imagery. We push back darkness. That's the task, I think, of every Christian in the fallen world, to push back darkness. Yeah. Because the fallen, wor a fallen world gravitates towards what? Gravitates towards chaos, brokenness, sin. And so as Christ followers, we image Jesus to the world by bringing, bringing order to chaos, by bringing restoration to brokenness, by bringing light to darkness. So yes, the house that, the house that you clean is going to get messy and dirty again, but we clean to bring beauty to the glory of God, right? That repair that we made to our car house might just break again, but we bring restoration to the glory of God. That small lie that your kid or your coworker is believing might not make much of a difference in your life, but we speak the truth in love to the glory of God, bringing light into darkness. We plant those flowers to bring beauty to barrenness. We serve our elderly neighbor to bring community to loneliness. And the list, as you guys know, could go on and on and on and on, right? This is how we shine Christ's light into a dark world. And all of this abounding in the work of the Lord is done with thanksgiving in our hearts. Because it overflows from the abounding love and grace of God toward sinners like us. Galatians, or Colossians 3.17 says this. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're doing it, everything, again, all-encompassing, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. We're, we're powerless to glorify God on our own. In our own strength or out of our own goodness, we don't have it. But by faith in Jesus, he is good. He is all-powerful. And so in Christ, as he works in us and through us, we can, with thanksgiving in our hearts, bring glory to God with our actions. And so, Pine Valley Community Church, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord's, in the, in the small things and in the big things of life. Now, that's a big command, but again, we don't have to go out and obey that command in our own strength or out of our own goodness. Because that command is like buttressed in this passage by two unshakable, immovable pillars. And those pillars are what give us the freedom and the motivation to obey this command. So the first pillar that he has in this passage is, therefore, my beloved brothers. Therefore, my beloved brothers. So first, let's just think about how Paul addresses this church. Loved brothers. Loved brothers. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians at all, you know this, this church was a pretty jacked up church. Right? They had a lot of things going on, a lot of sin happening in their church. They were messed up in all sorts of crazy ways. So if you look at the Corinthian church, you're not thinking, man, this church is a church that's just abounding in the work of the Lord. 
you're thinking, man, this church is really messed up. You think of how Paul addresses them. Paul addresses this church, this messed up sinful church, he addresses them as my beloved brothers. My beloved brothers. So I think in this phrase alone, we see the grace of God at work, right? The grace of God toward failures, toward people who have messed up, toward those who have sinned and been sinned against. These people are brothers to the great church planting apostle Paul, right? And the foundation of their brotherhood is the grace of God alone. That's why he can be brothers with these people who have messed up because Paul knows that apart from Christ, he's nothing as well. And so we're all equal. We come all needing, needing Jesus and his grace. What we've done or what we haven't done, what we've accomplished or haven't accomplished, those things don't add or take away anything from our standing before God. Because remember, what's our standing on? We stand on the gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And that's good news because that means we're adopted all into the same family. We're all sons and daughters of the Father in heaven. We're all brothers and sisters with one another. So even that this a command, isn't that a command for you to obey all by yourself? This is a command for us to obey as a church family. So Pine Valley Community Church, remember that. You are beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. And the heart of this first pillar, as good news as that is, the heart of this first pillar actually lies in there, the word therefore. Therefore, because he's pointing back to everything that came before in 1 Corinthians 15. He calls them to, to look back at the gospel, right? The, the gospel and then the beautiful resurrection life that is a result of the gospel. Because of what Christ has done, now we get this hope, this future hope, but also this hope that breaks into the present and lives through us now. 1 Corinthians 15, 32, Paul said this, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If our hope is in this life only, then of course we ought to be selfish, right? We ought to be selfish. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Get all you can while you can. Someday the music's going to stop and the party's going to be over. So look out for yourself. Look out for number one. But, Paul says, in fact, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, that changes everything. It changes everything. If Christ has been raised from the dead, then our gain is in him. We don't have to look to this world for gain, because we have eternal gain in Christ. We can suffer loss in this life, knowing that through loss, we even gain more of Jesus. We share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, so that by any means possible, we might too attain the resurrection of the dead. Yes. And so if you trust in Jesus, your resurrection is certain, because Christ has been raised from the dead. God has given us the victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news, because death isn't the end of the story. Death is actually just the beginning of the story, right? So the losses we experience in this life, we know that we have an eternal life to look forward to. Therefore, therefore, because of all that good news, we can obey this command. The other pillar that holds up this command is the final, the final phrase, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So why do we abound in the work of the Lord? We abound in the work of the Lord because our labor is never wasted. This is 100% return on investment. This is the best promise you're ever going to have. This is an article of faith, though, because it doesn't feel that way, often does it? It certainly doesn't look that way in our lives or in the lives of other, others. It doesn't look like that in the world, oftentimes. In fact, if we go back to Ecclesiastes, if you have a worldview under the sun, it actually seems like the exact opposite. He says everything is vanity in the striving after wind. Because if we keep our eyes just on this world, that's what it feels like oftentimes. Everything is vanity and striving after the wind. But the gospel flips that upside down. The gospel flips that upside down and changes everything. It says, no, actually, in the Lord, not a single ounce of your labor is in vain. Nothing is in vain. It all has purpose. It all has meaning. And that's not because you give it purpose or meaning, but because it is in Christ. It is the work of the eternal Son of God, the Lord of glory, in and through you. 
It has meaning because it's the work of Jesus, right? It's not ultimately even our work. It's Jesus' work through us. So just think about this. You are one of 8 billion people on planet Earth. And it is estimated that Earth is just one of 700 quintillion planets in the observable universe. That's 7 followed by 20 zeros. All right? If you take a step back like that and just observe the world and observe the universe, our lives can sometimes feel very insignificant. Right? But the Lord of glory, the creator of all of those things, the creator of heaven and earth, the one, again, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, he left his throne of glory, entered into this earth to pursue and love you. Right? And so if you ever question your significance, no. You can look to what Jesus has done. He's come to love you, pursue you, to die for you. You are significant because Jesus Christ says so. And he demonstrated it in every way possible, especially in going to the cross to die in your place. And as a result, Jesus Christ then infuses all of our labor in him with eternal significance. All of it. He died to redeem us. And so now our labor has eternal significance. So even if you poured out your heart and soul into something for the glory of God and it utterly fails, it wasn't wasted. This means that if you sacrifice for love and serve another person, if that person never even comes to Jesus, that time was not wasted. It means if you change a dirty diaper and your kid blows it up again two minutes later, that time wasn't wasted. Right? You were pushing back darkness in that moment. <laughs> and by grace, by Jesus' grace and his presence with us, he'll give us the power to get up and do it again and again. Amen. In this fallen world, our labor is often painful. So I don't want to like discount that. Our labor is painful. The Lord sees our hard work, though. All right? He sees all of our labor. He knows it. And our labor does not always produce the fruit or the outcome that we desire. But he's given us this promise that in the Lord, our labor is not in vain. He will get the results that he wants out of our labor. And so, in many ways, that frees us, right? That frees us to, to not be in control. That frees us to simply be faithful in what, what God has given us to be faithful in. Knowing that our labor will continue on with us in the presence of Jesus Christ for all eternity. Just listen to this from Revelation 14, 13. It says this. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So all of our labor, all of our labor in the Lord follows us into eternity. It wasn't wasted. Christ sees your work and your labor for him. All right, so I have, I usually don't have this many applications, but again, this verse has been very encouraging to, to my own walk. Um, and so I have three applications to, to just leave you with as we think about the gospel that empowers this labor. Let this verse be a comfort to you in difficult times. Let this verse be a comfort to you in difficult times. It is a fact. We live in a fallen world, right? And we will all face loss. We will all face disappointment. We will all face unmet expectations. This world's going to beat us up sometimes. However, if we hold fast to Jesus, we hold fast to Jesus through it all. We gain more of Jesus through it. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain, will not go unrewarded, because we have the greatest reward of all, that's Jesus Christ himself. With us, not only now, but for all eternity. Second application, let this verse free you to take risks for the kingdom of God. So we can take risks for the kingdom of God. Just think about how this verse frees us. If the re results are completely out of our hands, then, then all God desires from us is faithfulness. The results are out of our hands. We don't have to be in control of it. And faithfulness, while hard and difficult for us sometimes, is actually not very complicated at all. Faithfulness simply requires us to cling to Jesus, abide in Jesus, right? Jesus was once asked, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus gave this answer to that question. 
said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You believe in him. You believe in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. You depend on Jesus. You treasure Jesus. And so when we trust in Jesus, we get Jesus. And then we overflow Jesus to the world. We overflow his love to the world. This means we don't have to worry about whether something will succeed or fail. We don't have to wonder if someone will, if through our work or through our testimony, somebody's going to come to Christ or not. Jesus is in charge of the results. We can simply be faithful. We're free to take risks. We can fail. And we can then get up after we fail and try it again. Do it again. Knowing that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. And these losses that we experience, again, while they are real and power and painful, they will ultimately lead to gain in Christ. So there's no, there's no eternal loss for a Christian, right? There's only eternal gain for the Christian. In Christ, being in Christ is the most secure place that you will ever be. And so we are free then to offer up our lives to him. Our work has eternal significance, so let's get to it. Let's fight against the temptation in our culture to simply distract ourselves or to just drift through life, not being intentional with our decisions. Instead, we can be, we're free to be intentional, to seek the Lord, just to be about his work. Overflowing his love to those around us. Again, in the great things and in the small things. In the radical things and the ordinary things. We can abound in the work of the Lord through it all because his grace is abounded to us. <clears throat> and then finally, let this verse embolden you to face life and death with courage. Life and death with courage. When we die, everything that we've ever labored for, everyone that we've ever loved will be taken away from us. Yet nothing... Not even death itself will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so to live as Christ, to die as gain, we can face life and death without fear. Tim Keller, if you're familiar with him, Pastor Tim Keller, he, gave it, he was diagnosed with cancer several years ago. He's since died from that cancer. But after he was diagnosed with cancer, he gave an interview. And I was watching this interview. And the, the person interviewing him asked, what he would say to young adults fearful of the future. Okay, so that's the context. Like, what would you say to young adults fearful of the future? Not even necessarily death itself. And Tim Keller thought about this for a long time. He paused it and then he simply said, if Jesus has been, has been raised from the dead, then everything is going to be okay. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, then everything is going to be okay. He said, because if Jesus has been raised, then not only will humans be raised, but all of creation is going to be resurrected. And in a sense, raised from the dead and made new. All of creation. And then he went on to talk about how him and his wife had cried a lot together recently, just thinking about and talking about how little time they had left together on this earth. And he concluded his answer with this. And so we cry. We carry our wounds with us. But knowing that everything is going to be okay. Because our wounds are going to be healed by his. Amen. So that's the hope that we have. Yeah. Pine Valley Community Church, Jesus is alive. He is alive. Yeah. He is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father Almighty right now. He's interceding for us. And if Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, everything is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be okay. He will come back one day. He will fulfill all of his promises. He will make all things new. He will restore all of our brokenness, all of our hurt, all of our disappointment, all of our losses, all of our failures. We'll finally begin to comprehend God's great plan through it all. And he will give us joy unimaginable in him for all eternity. And so until that day, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's pray. Father, once again, we do just thank you for your grace and your mercy to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that this verse gives us. That it is certain you have been raised from the dead. And so we have hope. We have resurrection hope and resurrection life in you. And so help that to empower, empower us and encourage us to go out 
And be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain, Lord, in you. We need your help in this, Holy Spirit. Help transform our hearts and our minds to know you, love you, and trust in Jesus more and more. May we treasure Jesus more than we treasure all earthly treasures. And may that free us then to just be about your work in the world, to overflow your love to the people that you've put in our lives, to labor on even in the tedious and mundane things of life, knowing that it's not wasted time, it's not meaningless, it all has significance when done for your glory. And so I pray that you give us that. Give us that faith that depends on Christ and your strength in us. Give us that faith that wants and desires to do all things for the glory of God. And may that just overflow with thanksgiving in our hearts as we know that this is all from you, Lord. This isn't from us. This isn't from our goodness or our strength. This is all an overflow of the goodness and grace and love that you poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So we thank you for that love. And we pray all these things in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.
Will you pray with me, please? Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day and this church and your word and your spirit. And Father God, we thank you for all the gifts, all that you've given us in this life. Lord, we ask that you accept these tithes and offerings, accept us and use us. We are here because we want to say, take your name and say we're Christian. We love you. As we go out this week, help us keep the eyes eyes on the finish line. To know that even if there's only one person that you want us to talk to, even in a week, Lord, help us to not set expectations to put you in a box. Because we're here to look to you, follow your lead, and go where you point us. Help us, Lord, to give us the strength to do just that. And then at the end of the day, we know that we have done what you have told us to do. We look forward to the day where we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We thank you that because of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that day will come. Help us to follow through and be who you want us to be. Because we are children of God. That's who we are. Help us live into that truth. We thank you, Lord, that we can do that because of you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.